Hello everyone at LibreCon. I'm very happy to be here virtually uh, to share with you some ideas of digital innovations in public service transformation. Uh, my name is Audrey Tong. I'm from Taiwan. I'm Taiwan's digital minister. Taiwan is about um, seven hours in the future compared to Spain. Um, we're an island of about 23 million people. And six months ago, we elected our new president, Dr. Tsai Ing-wen. I was very happy because I voted for her. I did not know that I will uh, eventually join her cabinet. Um, I mean, the cabinet for about six weeks now. I voted for her because I live with seven cats and two dogs. Uh, and she's a fellow Emerald lover who lives with two cats and three dogs. Um, and we share some very similar values. Uh, such as marriage equality, such as aborigine rights, such as a deep respect of ecology, and, and so on. So um, she's a very, very um, progressive thinker, and I'm very happy to have this chance uh, to serve in the public service. And by the way, this is our first family. So um, during the transition time, I was an advisor to the previous cabinet on open data affairs. And the previous cabinet uh, was headed by the previous premier, Dr. Simon Zhang. And Simon Zhang is also uh, very interesting because the transition, which took four months, is completely peaceful. And I think this is because uh, Simon was an ex-Google engineer who belonged to no parties, who is independent. And Simon's main contribution uh, was that he mandated that all the public service systems built under 1 million euros must be made open data by default, which means that um, barring the exception of national security, of privacy, and of trade secret, every public service system must produce data that is under open license and that can be read by free and liberal software. And just by this act alone, Taiwan has become the top place in the global Open Data Knowledge Foundation uh, Index. And then an even more interesting thing happened. Our current premier, uh, Dr. Lin Quan, is also an independent. And he has formed a cabinet that has more independent members, including me, than members of any party. So this is why I often say that we're now moving towards a post-party politics. And the two independent um, premiers did something very interesting during the transition. They agreed that all the ministries must upload all their checkpoint documents to the public, to the internet, and for the new cabinet to download from the internet. This means that this is not a transition between two parties, but from one cabinet to the public and then to the next cabinet. And this is um, the norm now in Taiwan. Um, independent politicians are considered normal. For example, our Taipei city mayor, um, Dr. Ke Wenzhe, who was a surgeon, is independent. Our vice president, Dr. Chen Jianren, a um, master of um, study of epidemiology, um, is also independent. And um, I think this political climate changed, uh, much like in Spain, um, because of a Occupy. During uh, 2014, we had the Occupy Parliament where students um, occupied the national parliament because the legislators at the time refused to deliberate a trade service agreement. And so the so-called Sunflower Movement is basically a demonstration. It's not just for protesting, but demonstrating that when the legislator refused to debate something, there is a way for the citizens, ordinary citizens, occupy us to deliberate on this issue together using deliberative technology. And the technology was supported by a bunch of hundreds of people who donated their skill and time. Um, we're part of this GovZero movement with the call to fork the government. And what does this mean? It means that whenever we see something, uh, a government's website, not to our liking. Uh, for example, the National Environmental Agency, that would be EMV, 
the G O V, the T W. Now, instead of you know criticizing, we would build a E M V the G zero V, the T W, that invites everybody to see exactly the same data, but in an open format, in a way that allows for citizen participation. And we did that for the national budget, for the national dictionary, and to a lot other uh, government websites. And the best thing about it is that you don't have to remember the website address because it's ex exactly the same, except the O is changed to a zero. So why are there so many civic hackers in Taiwan? Why are there so many people who want to donate um, their time and skills for democracy? I think this is because back in um, 1989, when the personal computer revolution was just started, that was also the year that I learned programming. It is also the year that Taiwan um, moves from a dictatorship and enjoy press freedom. So we are the same generation who learn computers and enjoy the freedom of speech. And then again, in 1996, when we had the first presidential election, that was also the year of World Web and of telecom privatization that also still guarantees people basic access to the internet and makes it much more available to the World Web. So again, democracy and internet grew together and fused into each other. So I think perhaps unique um, in the East Asian context, when we see the free software movement and then later the open source movement and then the free culture movement, um, we see free as freedom, as something that enables, that works with the freedom of speech instead of, you know, free of charge. It's just incidentally free of charge. And so because of this Occupy in 2014, by the end of that year, there's a lot of elections on the city level, just like in Spain, where the occupiers or people who supported occupiers become mayors, sometimes surprisingly. And so now we need to take the technologies that we use on the street, who listens to millions of people and scale it furthermore so that it can work with the public service. And because of this, the premier at the time and the deputy premier, Simon Zhang, said, OK, so we now need to work on crowdsourcing as our national agenda. And what does crowdsourcing mean? It means that the private sector and the public sector and the civil society, instead of, um, you know, just working at arm's length, it's now possible for the public sector to say, I actually have no idea uh, how to solve this problem, or I have just an inkling of an idea, but I don't have the details. And instead of imposing it on the public, um, the public sector would invite all the stakeholders in private sector and the civil society to join in the agenda setting. And I'll take a very concrete example. Um, I call this uh, a flu of the mind. It's a virus of the mind. It's called a meme um, called sharing economy. And just like um, a real biological virus, it has many different strains. Every practitioner of so-called sharing economy gives it a very different definition and operation. And one particular instance is called Uber. Uh, the Uber strain of um, sharing economy says basically that the public transport system is too old, it is too inefficient, and they think that by introducing an algorithm that dispatch cars, they can work much more efficiently. That was the meme. And just like a meme, if a driver believes this and drives for Uber, regardless of whether it's legal or not, it's spreading. It will spread to other drivers. And even if the driver, after driving for a while, found out maybe it's not the best deal after all, still, you know, the inoculation is private and the message has already spread. And so when we uh, talk about the Uber issue, we found out there's very little uh, a national state can do about Uber because, well, it's an app and it operates not in a physical office in Taiwan. So any uh, legal action that we can do is bound to be somewhat limited. 
So we thought maybe the best idea is not to declare it as you know one way or the other. Maybe the best way is for people to deliberate, to think together, instead of arguing very loudly through media. What we thought is a way that links all the stakeholders together and listen to what each other has to say and hopefully come to a consensus. This is because deliberation, thinking deeply about something, is an inoculation against ideology. It's an inoculation against, you know, this kind of memes that will just blind people to each other's feelings and new facts. And a proper deliberation, as we established during the Sunflower Movement, um, has four different steps. The technologies that we need to employ differs from stage to stage. The first stage is what we call the objective stage or facts. In this stage, people are welcome to propose anything. We don't do voting, we don't do you know, any kind of polling. We just collect observable facts from all the stakeholders involved. And then we ask about people's feelings. The same facts may elicit different feelings. I can feel happy, you can feel sad or angry. This really, there's no right and wrong. But it is very important because on the third stage, which is ideas, the best ideas is judged by whether it can take care of the most people's feelings. And finally, after facts, feelings, and ideas, we move to decisions. And of course, the public sector, the minister, still has to bear the responsibility of decisions, but at least they can make the decision with people's ideas, with people's feelings, with the facts in mind. But it didn't usually work that way because there is a gap in the language that was used during agenda setting in the government and usually with the representatives from the private sector who may or may not want to keep some information to themselves and share only part of their information with the government. There's of course independent experts, academics, scholars who share in a very different way. But all in all, this uses the expert's language that differs markedly with the common language of people on the street. And the more um, the government want to maintain a united front before announcing anything, the larger the gap uh, the people on the streets information has and the people in the government have. And so the wider the gap, the more likely that the ideas on the street will become ideologies. You see, ideas are great. But ideas must take care of people's feelings and the facts. Ideas in an environment where people don't even share the basic facts and feelings grow into ideologies. And ideology to me is a uh, even more dangerous form of meme that blinds people to new facts, that blinds people to each other's feelings. So to do open government, our first priority is to publish all the data not only from the government, not only for the public sector, but also in our data portal in everywhere, we invite people from the private sector and the civil society to contribute data. And this is what we have done. And second, we need a scalable um, tool to collect people's feelings, either synchronously or asynchronously. And in this case, in the Uber's case, over about three weeks of time, we use this open source free tool called Polis. And in Polis, we basically show one sentiment that is shared by your fellow citizen. And as you click yes or no, your avatar would move in this two-dimensional map that automatically clusters people who share different feelings, who share the same feelings. So at the beginning, people were very polarized. They were in the corners. But because we say we only take as agenda anything that can convince a supermajority of people, meaning all of the majority group plus half of the minority group. So people compete to get more nuanced, much better uh, ideas that would take care of the maximum people's feelings. So on the feeling stage, basically, what we're saying is that we welcome people's feelings that are also common feelings among other people. So we identify consensus among divisions. And so this is the basic interface. And there were um, thousands of 
par uh, participants, there were uh, tens of thousands of votes. And by the end, we did get a bunch of consensus items that everybody, including Uber drivers and taxi drivers, can agree to. And then we would ratify it. But before ratification, uh, we meet with all the stakeholders at that time on a face-to-face -face live consultation. And because the facts and feeling stage are already collected, for this, we deploy another set of technologies using live streaming, using chat room, using synchronous uh, responses that basically collects everybody's um, responses to the common feelings. And all the stakeholders, once they promise something, once they clarify something, is then kept not only through live stream, but through transcripts for the entire country and for the world to see. So in this case, people speak uh, with a lot of civility because they know thousands of people are watching. <clears throat> so by the end of this consultation period, um, the Ministry of Transport then takes the consensus items and ratify it into our new e-taxi regulation. In the regulation, basically, we take <clears throat> the best parts that Uber has to offer. <clears throat> For example, the five-star rating system. For example, um, the ability for people to ride share at some day, or for example, a way um, for people to uh, keep track of their uh, past travels and a way uh, for the cars not necessarily to be painted yellow. But then we put it into a way that we understand that will not negatively impact any other stakeholders groups. And because of this, other uh, legitimate companies or co-ops even locally that want to operate as something like the e-taxi fleet can now compete on a fair basis and knowing that the people, the popular will is behind them. But of course, all these um, consultations are very hot topics for the media because there were a lot of protests, there were a lot of conflict. But there's um, many other important issues than these public consultation that may or may not get the same uh, coverage of media, which is why soon as I become the digital minister, I started running my own uh, media studio, basically. For example, uh, I have this WiseLife page at wiselife.com slash Audrey Tom. That basically it's a ask me anything platform that people from the press, people, uh, just individuals, stakeholders, foreign journalists, everybody can just post any question here and I strive to answer within 24 hours. And every answer of, of mine is sent to thousands of sub subscribers email box. And through this kind of direct communication method, I'm able to make transparent everything that I have participated. For example, uh, when the senior VP uh, of Uber's strategy, uh, David Plouffe visited Taiwan, um, I did meet him but under a 360 camera that records the entire conversation from the time he enters my door to the time he leaves my door. And the entire um, video is published not only on the usual social media, but also transcribed using the same transcripting technology, which is called Say It. It's developed uh, in my society in the UK. And again, every word that I say, every word that he says is kept for the record. So there is um, minimal worry about, you know, a single stakeholder setting agenda, but rather I invited him to share his side of the story and facilitate communication with other stakeholders. So I think uh, in addition to the data portals that we already have, uh, in addition to the data portals that share, let everybody share their um, raw material, what we need to work on next is a integration because, um, there's very few people with the ability to engage all the different sources of data from the private, from the public, and from the civil society. Rather, if all our data systems can publish using a well-known compatible API format, um, and in particular, the open API specification, it becomes much easier to integrate it into investigative journalism, into chatbots, into virtual reality, into any devices that we may care. So this is why, as a digital minister, I also proposed a change uh, to our procurement laws so that all the public systems are paid by taxpayer money 
um, is best um, constructed with a machine-readable version of itself. And so the human-readable version may be just a shell, uh, a front-end to the back-end open API. And once the open API is made open, um, independent ministries, independent units can connect their services together, and the connection does not need to be made as um, one or the other's duty, and a third party can also do this kind of integration. And so to determine the roadmap like this, we use a lot of offline tools, such as this is so-called business origami. Our team meets every week to decide on the roadmap to the week, and then we run our daily um, Kanban, our daily board, using this kind of post-it notes. But because our team is now about 15 people, um, we have two co-locations, and it's no longer practical to uh, use the same physical board every day, which is why we also used uh, the weekend system, which is an open source system that enables this kind of Kanban uh, integration to drag every card from waiting to doing to finished. And Weekend, again, is just one of the many tools that was offered. Um, and we're still uh, working with the Sandstorm team. And Sandstorm is a collection of independent uh, open source API, open source application, open source web-based uh, projects. So this includes uh, file sharing. DevRose is like Dropbox. EtherCalc, this is actually what I wrote with Dan Brankling and I maintain, is like Google Spreadsheets. EtherPad is a collaborative note-taking documentation. Um, WorkPad is like HackPad, and then we can the Kanban board. And all this is built um, inside the government, in the government cloud. So what this means is that all the ministries and even people in the regional government can share each other's collaborative documents very easily and deploy new applications as easy as installing an app on your phone. And so this kind of um, space is what we call the public digital innovation space. Uh, it is a internal startup uh, inside the national government. And our work is based on this very simple idea. Maybe voting is just the beginning of democracy. Everybody can vote. On the other hand, in Occupy, a few people can dedicate uh, a lot of time to do a general setting by occupying the parliament. But we cannot just have democracy with these two modes. It is too fluctuating, too unpredictable. And the way we work is by having a open data, open API platform, so that everybody can share freely and doing analysis freely using the data that's produced by public systems. And every time people who has a petition or has a question and the public service has a way to systematically answer it within a given time frame. And this is the beginning. And then the stakeholder need to learn to discuss with each other. And this takes trust and trust takes time. And then eventually people will learn to listen. And once people can learn to listen to each other, then we can make new cases, new, more nuanced regulations that take care of every stakeholder's interests. And this is how we crowdsource agenda setting eventually. And we understand that at each time, the people with ability to participate get gradually fewer and fewer. But it is OK, because as long as people form a ladder of learning and share the technology, share the process in the commons, anyone who wants to learn more can connect with people upper in the ladder. And everybody who has some other work to do or are more commitments can very safely uh, fall down to a lesser uh, engagement layer, but still enjoy the fruits of the tools of the open technology that was produced by the upper ladders. And I think this is how we can avoid the polarization, uh, the so-called um, filter bubbles that is built by the current generation social media. Instead, what looks like conflicts can often be resolved by introducing a time dimension. And then this is mathematically called resolving singularity. We listen to one size ideas, document it fully, and make the uh, interim consensus publicly available. And then we ask for more feelings and ideas from the other stakeholders, and so on and so on, like a spiral that will eventually converge 
uh, into something that has much more consensus from the society. So to conclude my talk, I would like to quote from Dr. Tsai Ing-wen in her inauguration speech. She said, before, democracy was a clash between two opposing values. But now, democracy must be a conversation, a dialogue between many different values. We need to build a unified democracy that is not hijacked by ideologies. We need to build a pragmatic democracy that can respond timely to the needs of the private sector and of the civil society. And finally, we need to build a democracy that lets people take care of each other and each other's feelings. And we do this just by listening. And all the technologies, all the liberal and free open technologies are there to help us to listen to each other at scale. So just keep listening to each other. Thank you for listening.